This is Jeff Berlin, and I'm here with Sarah Childress. Hello, Hello Sarah. everybody. Hey, Jeff. Hi, What's up? Sarah. <laughs> and uh, we're here today. Actually, it's a bit of a cloudy day, I think, today yeah. in Nashville. Quite rainy, but <clears throat> I like those days. It kind of, kind of reminds me of my youth in New York. Mm. We had a long months of this sort of dark, kind of gloomy weather, and I hadn't seen that uh, when I left Florida, you don't have that there in Florida. No, so. and that's why all the people from New York moved to Florida. That's right. We have sunshine in Florida. Do we do yes, have sunshine. We do. Well, here we have gloom, but I'm happy with <laughs> gloom. But nevertheless, we're happy inside. We are happy inside. Yes. So here we are. So um, we're going to talk about things bass, things musical. The idea, of course, is to share ideas and hopefully uh, make uh, people have a better life in music. So uh, I'll offer some thoughts. And of course, Sarah is, uh, she, I regard Sarah as the point man, if I could gen, be in gender wise incorrect, <laughs> Absolutely. as the person who really keeps me guided on the right topics because I tend to go off to the left of the right, like, you know, what about music? And I'm 35 minutes later, then after my 35 minute intro is finished, then I'll get to the topic. So I think you had some thoughts. And uh, yeah, and, and every once in a while I have a thought to contribute to. So. Okay, yes, you do. <laughs> And bravo. And <laughs> just like that, yeah. Bravo. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I'm here to add structure and then add my two cents, too, Please which do. is always fun. So, yeah, I know um, we wanted to, since we've been sort of hitting the bass lessons pretty hard the last little bit, you know, we'll, we'll continue to sort of think about the lessons. Um, but w I think we're going to sort of broaden our scope a little bit. So oh. we're going to start, I think, today with some, just some news and some thoughts and some announcements. So, like, for example, we just got the packages back. Yes, uh, we did. We just got... Uh, I should say specifically the charts back from Rob, who's been um, con you know, helping us sort of spit and polish them. So those just came through on email just mm -hmm. a few hours ago, and I finished the video. So we're actually going to be delivering package five today, which is super exciting. Yeah. And I heard a little bird told me that there might be a package six in the works. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> so after five comes six. So what have you been thinking about? With well, I, I started six today. Uh, first, I was. I have to confess, I worked on packages one through five. I'm going to guess close to a year mm -hmm. around. Sure. Uh, and and I kept going back and redoing, and then I'd go back and redo again and redid again. And the reason, of course, is to make sure that. I would have the leanest and the best material that I would felt so confident that people could learn by. Mm -hmm. So now that everything is done, and Rob Rob is a, is a Sibelius guy who mm -hmm. has taken everything that I've done in Sibelius and put it into a PDF and made it uh, readable to people. And I have to celebrate the fact that f finally I, I'm done with yeah. this project officially. I mean, I may fix, like if somebody says you should have written an F sharp, sure, and sure, sure. they'll let us know, and, and I will fix that. Um, but I'm so glad that I'm now able to proceed onward to six. And That's true, high five, let's high take five. a minute. You're right, you're right. We should take a moment just to celebrate the fact that one through five. Yeah. Ah, that's, oh. that's a breath, <laughs> breath of relief and Gosh. excitement that they are out in the world. If I, if I hear that's anyone true. say the number one, two, three, four, five again, I'll tilt. <laughs> exactly. I can't love, I can take it. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. We need to take a moment right now to celebrate that. I agree. That's, that's an amazing thing. That's an amazing accomplishment. Thanks. I, I feel, I mean, you know how vocal I am about mm -hmm. bass ed and music, etc. And I said, I have to do something that is so completely trustworthy mm -hmm. to make a better musician mm -hmm. that there isn't any you know question about it sure. because especially a guy like me with all the the big mouth sort of comments mm -hmm. that i've made over the years um people are now obliged to possibly respond in kind and mm -hmm. i said that's fair mm -hmm. so i said look i mean i didn't do this to head anybody off but i said the material has to be so great that the principles are simply 100 percent trustworthy in my opinion mm -hmm. so now that this is done, actually today, mm -hmm. just today, before I came to see you and mm -hmm. John, I actually took, uh, I started exercise, a uh, package six, mm -hmm. which I hope will have be done in about uh, two, three months. Cool. So and do you want to tease up any aspects of it or what you're, what you're thinking about as the sort of the, uh, the, the topic or the, yeah. the principle or idea that will be elaborated? Yeah. There, there's a... I have about four or five or six different ideas of packages I intend to do over the next year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. I want to keep the uh, lesson things uh, uh, continuing. And package six 
is based in uh, my presenting lines using a word that I have to say it is not a word that I like mm -hmm. uh, in in terms of regard as a, the word groove. Mm -hmm. And uh, just two seconds to clarify, groove is a word that I partially disdain in that it is a word that supersedes playing, learning uh, the, the function of music because music, and I'll be done in a second, music is does not rely on a groove. Re music relies on three or four principles. A bass line, uh, Sunshine of Your Love, you mm -hmm. know the bass line by mm -hmm. Jack, da, 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 da. and that relies on notes, rhythm, uh, the tone one presents, and eventually groove. So it's a groove is only a part it is not the emphasis as i think a lot of bass players mm -hmm. believe so i hesitatingly use this word because i'm i've already started today to write out bass lines mm -hmm. that are groove oriented in this principle that they are written in keys they are rhythms that are to be repeated bass lines to be repeated mm -hmm. and i've written them out so that they will be read and played in 12 keys. Mm -hmm. And once that line, that line is finished, you'll go to the next line in C major seven, let's say, then I go through the other sharps and uh, flats, not, excuse me, not sharps and flats, uh, chord types, chord types. Mm -hmm. So I've done one line already, two lines actually in C major. I have maybe six or seven or eight more to do. Mm -hmm. And they are repeated and similar lines from the previous line. I like sequence and lessons. Okay. And so you'll have about eight lines and 12 keys that are funk oriented in four, four. I will include three, four. And then you'll, I'll do it in major seven, minor seven, minor seven, flat five. Mm -hmm. They will be funk lines. They will be great to perform with if one wishes to, although that is not my goal. Gotcha. My goal is ac academic. So that's what I'm doing. I'm writing funk lines and different rhythmical lines mm -hmm. that pertain to groove in that when you play them in time, they're going to be sexy. They're going to be really hip lines, nice. but they're academically perfect. Mm -hmm. That's how I, I like that's teaching. That's how you roll. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Awesome. Well, I cannot wait to see how this transpires. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, and speaking of things that have transpired, we just had our first office hours, which was so much fun. Yeah, that was. It was so much fun. Oh, my gosh. And I was also really impressed <laughs> by the answers that you that, I gave. That, that you gave to the questions that was really cool <laughs> i didn't pontificate too much no you kept to specifics which was which was i think yeah sarah is advising me uh, and correctly <laughs> so like someone will say how do i learn and the first thing i say is well a metronome and sarah kind of goes <laughs> so so she's been keeping me honest and trying to help me that i can actually help people with a direct question by giving them a direct answer so <laughs> Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm just laughing because, and when you give direct answers, I mean, I was sitting next to you going like, damn, son. Yeah. Like, that's impressive. Boy, You're, am like, I really direct. smart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that was great. Yeah. So I learned a lot. And I'm... it was also just really wonderful to be able to see, you know, a lot, uh, many of the guys that I've had sort of email conversations with. And it's yeah. just, it really is amazing that the technology works to have that face to face interaction. Yeah. So, you know, Toby's able to play you pieces from the etude and you can see him play, and Chris doing the same thing. And, right. you know, just right, right. seeing John and Ron asking the questions and yeah it was just it was it was fun and it was like edutainment fun entertainment and it was it was and Jeff here again education comes first but if the entertainment factor is included I mean I'm a bit of a kibitzer I mean I like you know <laughs> well, I'm sort of Shecky together, Berlin yeah, exactly. you hear you know and so yeah. I like the kibitz around yeah, but yeah. it was actually good I, I appreciated your input and I felt very happy that I made answers of a specific yes. nature. So how do I work on this? Well, watch your hand here and play these mm -hmm. notes. This is so uh, uh, meaningful because mm -hmm. it, if people would adhere to these simple little suggestions, they're going to get better mm -hmm. because the suggestions apply to everybody. And, and I, we saw a couple of the guys, actually, I think it was Toby who played better. Um, I don't recall who oh, was. Oh, yeah, playing. it was because you were, I forget now, he was buzzing he was a little buzzing. bit. Yeah, and you were able to immediately identify what was creating that buzz, and mm -hmm. then he was able to rectify it immediately. I mean, that's what's so wonderful, is you're able to answer not only sort of universal or general questions, but also to give really sort of personal and personalized. So if, if, if guys are at a particular 
place in their process, then you can sort of help them with that, you know, individual moment, individual place, individual process, which of course has larger resonances, which is why it's cool to see everyone hanging yeah. out and listening to those individual interchanges because it's amazing what you can get out of even very specific and, and direct answers. Well, a lot of bass players, and I think a lot of people listening to this will agree that bass players tend not to be able to fix difficulties immediately or they'll try different things on their own mm -hmm. methods and their own terms and their own investigations. And you know, wishing to fix things often can't because there's a solution that, that they may not be aware of just due to inexperience in, in, as they're learning mm -hmm. music and how to play. Mm -hmm. Where I come in is I am the bass whisperer. I'm not an egotist, I'm not arrogant. I can fix anybody's problem at any time. And the reason is, is because I lived every problem at some time sure. in my life. There's, that's a commonality. I mean, a, a guy that bowls is inevitably going to twist his wrist and gutter the ball. Mm -hmm. There isn't a lot of bowlers new to the game, let's say, that comes up with a problem in bowling that has not been experienced mm -hmm. by everyone else in bowling before. I know this. So as a bass player and on the uh, office hours, especially those guys that had joined us, had a chance that in about three, four minutes, had I had a chance to fly over and hang out with them in Pittsburgh <laughs> or wherever the guys live, you know, I could deal with the thing and solve it right then and there because it's not difficult uh, problems that they're running into. It's problems that they don't know how to fix. Mm -hmm. That's why I like the office hours. In fact, I, I think it's the greatest thing you came up with. Like Sarah came up with it. <laughs> I, I didn't come up with it. I, well, but and, and the reason why is exactly the reason why I came up with it is exactly what you've just described. Yeah. Because I've uh, we in the university setting always have office hours because it's an opportunity for students who are sort of off doing their homework assignment, right. but who are struggling in their individual process. It's an opportunity for them to come and share kind of what they're working on. Oh. Uh, uh, and, and so that, it, just as you were saying, you know, I'm sort of the teacher, been through it, can help give them a little sort of different perspective or sort of, you know, a bigger picture view to help them move forward in their progress. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what you're describing too. And so that's why I thought, hmm, if we can figure out a way to do this, wouldn't it be cool to have not only that opportunity for one-on-one -on -one interaction with you, but also the opportunity for you to identify very specific um, problems that oh, individual yeah. people are, are doing. So I'm... I'm glad that they've seemed to have found it to be very helpful, and I'm glad that you're finding it a really sort of cool interactive opportunity. It's a lot well. of fun, and and, and uh, I'm glad I had you know thank you. And this is one of the first times Sarah didn't twist my arm like like the muscle, <laughs> the skin usual. right here, like one like of those pinchy pinch witches. Yeah, me like a little knot. Don't talk <laughs> yeah. about that stupid metronome. I hear that word again, Jeff. Okay, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. So, not twist, but twist. I'm like the that. enforcer. The yeah, enforcer. Exactly. <laughs> Though speaking of enforcement and being a professor, you know, it makes me think, um, you know, one of the things that we want to do with these podcasts is sort of branch them out into sort of larger topics as well, but that still relate to base education, education sure. in general. And since this is finals time at uh, my university, uh, mm -hmm. one of the uh, final assignments or in lieu of a final exam that I did for my students who are all filmmakers was, okay... You're, they're all 18, they're all first years in my film history class, which is a sort of a 100 level class, is, you know what, in lieu of dates and who did what when and how they all interact, I want you to think about your own process and your own creative um, experience in terms of thinking about who you are right at this moment as a filmmaker, what stories you can uniquely tell as the individual that you are, and how can you tell those stories in a way that's not only individual to you, but that also speaks to the entire history of film. Because we don't, we don't live, we don't know, and we don't create in a vacuum. Right. Our knowledge, our experience, and also our expression is usually informed from a particular sort of history, whether it's our own personal history. Like we were just talking about Reuniti, you know, and I was laughing because, you know, the Reuniti commercials are what I came up on with. Ice. It, it That's nice. Tastes so nice. Tastes so nice. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's the pop culture. It's, it's the fact that we are all sponges and we all live and, you know, we don't live, no man is an island and no person grows up in a vacuum. So we are an amalgamation, not only of our personal experiences, but also of our pop cultural experiences. And so that is why it was help it was making me think, 
hmm, since I'm thinking about sort of the voice, helping my students find their voice and using this as an opportunity for them, how might musicians find their voice or their sort of sense of stylistic expression on their own instrument? Well, it, it's, it's, a, it's not even a loaded question. In fact, it is a rather simple question to answer. Mm -hmm. When you consider that freedom on an instrument, meaning the freedom to play, and freedom from thinking of where do I put my fingers uh, and freedom from what's the name of this chord or what's the name of this scale or line or notes. The only thing left is emotion and possibly vision. Mm -hmm. That's it. So, but what happens is, is, is uh, musicians will look for creativity a little too early mm -hmm. and it would behoove everybody to know that once we've dealt with the mechanical elements of stuff, in the academic approach, the artistic is the legacy of that. Now, I, to clarify, because I'm thinking, as, as I'm talking, I'm sure. thinking, yeah. there's two ways to learn. Many people know that I've said this, mm -hmm. and one is the self-taught way, which is anything and everything, mm -hmm. literally with no boundary or any restriction on how one chooses to teach themselves or be involved in music to play. And the other is, of course, my uh, academic vision, which uh, most of the Western world uh, who weren't self-taught are all trained in it. So a style, uh, a means to play is the legacy possibility if the instrument of music is, this, is, is demystified. Um, you can also be in the self-taught experience while you're learning how to play my, my, my etudes per se. So while you're doing, because what I've done is not a replacement, it's an addition to. So a vision comes from guys experimenting on their own with no, what's the word, uh, preclusions of any kind? Mm -hmm. you, you can't, anything goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If one hears that this string should be interchanged with that type of a string. If one hears that these speakers work better than those, if one hears that the Clapton sound doesn't work quite as well as the Hendrix sound, anything and everything that one experiments with uh, denotes an elimination. And when you eliminate mm -hmm. something, you have to replace it mm -hmm. with something else. That's musical growth. Mm -hmm. And if you eliminate enough principles of music that don't reflect your heart's love of music, and you continually replace it with some other principle of music, you're getting closer and closer to a personal musical truth. And that is what style is. It is the truth of you. And it is there, sometimes in the greatest, highest levels, like Miles Davis or Jaco Pastorius or Jimi Hendrix, where the extremely successful representations of this come about probably due to their natural genius toward it. It's Those people are not really easily, uh, 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 you can't be like them, what's the way to, uh, not assimilatable. Um, it's hard to be like these people. They're just beyond us. Sure. So, but what you can do is take the lessons of them. What did they do? And what they did is they investigated self-taught and they learned music. Hendrix it was completely self-taught. Mm -hmm. uh, Jocko learned music. Jack Bruce, my great hero, has mm -hmm. a voice, was self-taught entirely, and was also taught musical content. So if, as you proceed in, in learning, um, you play something, and you love it, and you keep it. Mm -hmm. Then you try something else, and you don't like it, and you eliminate that. Mm -hmm. you got to, when there's a hole or, or a gap, you got to fill it with something. That's the investigation, and if mm -hmm. people do this, they're going to find a voice way more quickly than mm -hmm. they imagine. Well, it's so interesting. As you were speaking, it made me think of two words, exposure and experimentation. Oh, yeah. So that's one of the things that I'm constantly telling my students, which is, you know, my... Part of my gift to you is to expose you to films that you would normally be exposed to. Yes, I know everybody loves Edgar Wright's Baby Driver, but you know there's an entire history of film that Edgar Wright taps into to make Baby Driver, for example. But he's a huge Buster, Ke Buster Keaton fan. Buster Keaton, let's watch The General, etc. Right. So when I when I hear you say self-taught, you know one of the things that I think that we haven't possibly talked 
more about is that part of the self-taught paradigm is the exposure. Oh where, yes, where the you know the guys are actually exposing themselves to a wide variety of music in part to see what they like and what they don't like. But it's so interesting to me that with exposure and then translating that into experimentation with your own work and your in development of your own voice, it's amazing to me sometimes to feel like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm actually channeling yeah, Jack yeah. Bruce when I really thought I was, you know, a Jaco Pistorius guy or, you know, something sure, like that. Sure, so sure, it's sure, amazing sure. when you start enacting the things that you've exposed yourself to, your voice can sometimes come out in ways that you might not expect, but that's the fun part of it. Well, th there's, I liked uh, one point, it actually stimulated a thought, which is uh, exposing oneself to lots of music musical variety. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a hitch to that, mm -hmm. which is, mm -hmm. and I'll point out to the guys like Hendrix. Hendrix basically was a was an R&B blues guitarist, mm -hmm. played with the Isley Brothers, played with Little Richard. His exposure was very narrow mm -hmm. in a certain genre of music, but who in his own sense heard things that he wished to do. That was his own self-inspiration. Uh, the Beatles are a great example. Mm -hmm. They were influenced by basically American R&B. Mm -hmm. You know, Chuck Berry, Elvis, Amer you know, Fats, uh, Fats, Fats Domino. Domino. Mm -hmm. You know, that American uh, R&B music. Uh, sure, and, well, when look at how all the British uh, rockers stole from the bluesmen. And that mm -hmm. precisely, I mean, the, the, the British blues scene is, is rests entirely on the creation of, of, of American blues artists. Mm -hmm. Um, what I'm saying is, is that often it isn't a wide variety of listening where I would choose to listen to funk, blues, jazz, classical, Beethoven, Mozart, Saint-Saëns, mm -hmm. uh, Ravel, uh, you know what I mean, uh, six-string bass players who play eight-string uh, guitar players. I mean, I don't necessarily would say don't do it. I'm saying is, is that usually guys that are into a thing... Mm -hmm deeply get into that thing. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So... They don't listen to 40, 50 different bass players and, and this type of approach. Do you think that's good? Like, you know, to go deeper instead of broader? I do. And uh -huh. I do, as a general rule, you can't speak for everybody, sure. but the general point is most people know what they like. Sure. And what they like denotes where they should go to give them the skills to play what they like. Mm. And often... Excuse me. There, there's sort of a, a concept where um, uh, they'll teach, uh, you know, listening to the bass playing of McCartney, Pino Palladino, Jaco Pastorius, Rocco Prestia, um, upright bass players, funk bass players, blues bass players, rock bass players, and there's a sort of soup, a menage of all these bass players. Mm -hmm. And I personally found that if I already know more or less that what I'm into, I'll listen to the bass players of that genre. And then I can go to a guy and say, by the way, who's, who else is out there? Mm -hmm. So I'm not terribly trusting of the idea that I need to be shown from another source, a class, a teacher, a, a, a point of view where I need to be exposed to many bass players that it'll help me. In fact, it may confuse me. So um, it's not like it's bad, but it, it does sort of uh, dilute the focus, the focus. I'm into the blues. That's mm -hmm. what I'm into. Mm -hmm. So why go into, um, let's say, Ray Brown? Meaning, it's not doesn't mean don't listen to him, but why be directed there and being taught that this has meaning? Rather, I would say, hey, look, here's a Ray Brown CD. Go home and listen to it. And it's a kind of a, a lesser responsible uh, from the part of the bass player. If I'm into the blues or the rock, I would dive into that. And I would milk the, th the two or three or four thousand great musicians in that genre mm -hmm. and learn because that's the music I love. But what about the innovation that comes from hy hybridity, from actually going like, wow, I'd never heard of Ray Brown. It's, a, it's like an absolutely, it was an epiphany. Mm -hmm. And so now all of a sudden I'm really excited by that. And if I, can bring, if I can bring some of what I'm taking from that into what I'm doing... It may not be uh, as sort of direct aligned to this this sort of you know deep um, cavern that I'm exploring, but instead it takes me in a new direction that may help me innovate in a way that's actually en enriching. Oh yeah, well that's sort of why I said that this view of mine isn't hard written, mm -hmm. and it isn't it, it doesn't exclude what you just said. Mm -hmm. What I'm more or less saying is. A lot of bass players are taught to or decide mm -hmm. to seek a hundred different ex, uh, uh, in, influences or ex, experiences. Uh -huh. And while there's nothing bad about it, 
I feel quite confident that it dilutes it. So all I'm saying is, is that some may need the Ray Brown influence if they're an R&B guy. Mm -hmm. And with a great deal of other musicians, and I might sort of be so bold to say the majority of bass players, they're not really going to get much out of the Ray Brown thing. Mm -hmm. It might be nice to hear. It might be nice to pay attention. And I don't say don't listen to it. Sure. But I'm more or less sort of siding with the guy that knows what he loves. Mm -hmm. And those guys, if, if I were into rock, I mean, there's sub-genres of rock. There's, what is it, metal rock and, and, and uh, sure. Meshuggah. What's that band? Meshuggah? <laughs> Meshuggah. Yeah, that you're telling me. You about. know, exactly. that amazing, astonishing, uh -huh. you know, uh, the Van Halen tapping, the, the, the blues guys. There's sub-genres of rock, because I love rock, mm -hmm. or whom lo whoever loves rock. So it's not a hardcore thing I'm saying, sure. but if people want to develop a style mm -hmm. or develop their own voice, which is what uh, our, our originated yep. our little exactly. chat, for the most part, not entirely, it's the people that concentrate on the thing that they love and deeply immerse themselves mm -hmm. into it. Hendrix was a good example because there was nothing any, there was nothing that preceded him. Sure. Uh, you could hear a Hendrix thing sometimes when he played an acoustic guitar or played quietly on, an, on, a, on a blues guitar. And he literally sounded like everybody that played that genre. Mm -hmm. Hendrix did not sound like Ch Hendrix when he played the blues. Sure. Because he was reviewing a style that already existed and mm -hmm. probably helped influence him to get into what he got into. But his thing was self-generated. Mm -hmm. And that's why anybody that hears then here's the thing. If you hear something, do it. If if somebody even hears what you're doing and says, oh, that sounds ridiculous, I, ironically, I'd say do it twice as hard. Mm -hmm. Because you're on to something that other people haven't heard. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even to the point where it's kind of ridiculed, because a lot of bands were ridiculed. Players are, oh, I'm going to play like that. Sure. And then once it was really uh, noticed, mm -hmm. I mean, it made a great impact. So oh, the sure. innovators sometimes have to swim upstream Always, to acquire like. what they want. Yeah, and I guess, too, you know, I was thinking about having just uh, not too long ago seen the documentary on, on Jocko, you know, and, and being a proud native Floridian, too, yeah. thinking about how synthetic his style was, I mean, at least this is how the documentary represents it, uh, is that he was really drawing from lots of different musical backgrounds, Correct. including some Caribbean influences, in order to create what people constantly refer to as sort of like a Florida style. And so it was very interesting to hear him as a synthetic innovator, that he's actually bringing lots of different and disparate types of music together to create this particular voice that was so uniquely his. Well, his was, his story is unique. He was a guy who drew from any sources because he was interested. He was motivated. I literally mm -hmm. mean and believe that it was in his DNA mm -hmm. for him to be what he was. He had to listen to I mean, a lot of his bass lines, I understand, were inspired by conga rhythm. Mm -hmm. I mean, who thinks of something like this? It's a remarkable, self-motivated innovation. He was a guy, which is why I try to share this a lot with musicians, mm -hmm that he was a guy into music, nothing but music, only music, developing the music. And there are these guys that are fired up into mm -hmm. that. I am. There's a bunch of guys that are fired up by music. And these guys have no problem <laughs> seeking and developing as we know or have entrust ourselves to the process. And Jocko did that, you know, the process of, of finding a style and improving as a musician. Most bass players are not so whacked out, focused on music mm -hmm. as we are. But there's still a common thread that ties us all together, which is if we look and investigate things that we think, mm -hmm. one will realize we can or can't represent those ideas well. Now what do we do about mm -hmm. it? The neat thing about the packages, I got to go back to it, yeah. is that there's nothing to think about. It's a Simon Says. Simon Says, practice A, ma a major. Mm -hmm. And since A major is a factual f function of, of language, that takes care entirely, or certainly mostly entirely, of that element. So the, the self-taught Jaco Pastorius musician is the rarest creature on earth. Mm -hmm. He is, he must be accrued, uh, 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 not accrued, he must be accorded. Mm -hmm. He must be yeah. accorded <laughs> um, the same respect as a Picasso mm -hmm. because he sought something that others didn't seek. 
That's the sign of true genius, in my view, mm -hmm. and true originality. Well, and it makes sense, too, because I think about you sort of what you're describing um, is very similar to the process that I went through to get my Ph.D. So in the so it was a five year program mm. and the first two years are really about exploring. So you take lots of different classes and lots of different things, generally within your area of interest. But they want you to sort of go out, expose yourself to lots of different sort of subjects within your subject. But then by the third year, you're supposed to have a pretty clear sense of what your topic of study is going to be, what your research, what your research topic is. Right. And then they test the heck out of you on that. And then the next two years are really for you to write your dissertation, which is you are really to focus on one particular area and that's your deep dive. So they almost see it like a, a triangle almost, where you start you know, a little more broader, a little more sort of widespread, and then you sort of work towards this very particular apex. And of course, now having been through that process, I'm like, ooh, I want to turn it on its head because studying one thing for me, I mean, so this is my individual choice. Studying one thing for me was just not enough because I, I prefer to be more synthetic and expose myself more widely. Right. But, but it's essentially what you're describing is really, again, you know, you're talking about rooting your, your lessons in perfect musical content. You're also talking about a learning process that is rooted in pedagogical principles oh, no that are doubt. pretty longstanding as well. Um, but again, thinking about how individuals work within that well-established pedagogical process. Well, I, I ought to add one thing. I mean, what took you five years to get you your PhD, I mean, is the same inspiration that got me to win the fifth grade spelling bee. Because mm -hmm. I was the only kid in the fifth grade that knew that putts was spelled with a Z. Oh. So. <laughs> It's all the Yiddish underpinnings, too. That's You're it. like, ah, oh, it's like Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, Latin, Yiddish. <laughs> it's the Berlin Putz, P U T Z. I got that one. I got it. Yeah. Give um, you a leg up. There is a, 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 a point that uh, needs to be regarded that learning how to acquire a style or to become creative as a unique person is not a clean process. I have noticed the running point, as I used the term for you mm -hmm. earlier, that, and I will refer to that when people go to study, that any problem that may come up in your musical life has been anticipated and has been uh, a class or a solution has been assigned to you. Whether or not you've run into that problem as a bass player or not, mm -hmm. I, I see this as overkill because the, the truth is it's like take this cookie and eat it means there's going to be crumbs, so you can't stop it. The truth is, is that once you've learned to minimize the crumbs, you take a napkin and it's cleaned up. Mm -hmm. Bass playing is a crummy <laughs> experience. It is an experience mm -hmm. that is not clean. It is an experience that is gritty. It's kind of bumpy. It's kind of rather unfriendly. It exposes as anything in the arts can expose mm -hmm. one's inconsistency, mm -hmm. flaws, and incapabilities. Mm -hmm. Now the really serious guys go, fine. I mean, what could be better than to see exactly where I f am not capable and then want to do something about it? So the best players, honestly, have become so because they have not shied away from the awfulness, uh, you can't see the quote marks here, <laughs> of learning. Now, if base education or base teaching may anticipate everything, the best players don't shy or don't need things to be prepared for to, to prevent from happening. Nobody gets hurt, nobody dies, nothing bad happens. But the learning and the true achievement of a style that we were alluding to earlier and about good playing comes from really, the word is, uh, I, well, suck. I mean, to suck as a musician, to play badly as a musician is a right. <laughs> sure. You have a right to, to sound bad, <laughs> mm -hmm. to play badly, to play inconsistently, to make noises, to make fret noises, to sound like a, just awful. You, this is a beautiful uh, part of the learning experience so we can hear and see and either be told how to fix it or fix it ourselves. And it's the dirty part that becomes clean. It's like to find gold, you got to get into the mud. Mm -hmm. To find diamonds, you got to dig into the dirt. And that really does apply to great bass playing. So when uh, bass playing isn't clean, it's messy. And lucky in a way that it is because every dirty spot needs to be clean. You go in the kitchen, there's a mm -hmm. dirty dish there. You know exactly what to clean up. It honestly applies to bass.
Which makes perfect sense. And in fact, as you were speaking, it made me think about, you know, another twist to exposure, which is exposing yourself to that sort of, you know, self-reflection yes. and also forgiveness, you know, oh, to, yes. to, to live in Bravo. that and to expose yourself to your own, because exactly, you said it so, so beautifully, you know, when you're working in the arts and when you're working in a creative process, mm. like realizing like, ah, oh, that didn't work. That failure is inherently a part of that process and forgiving yourself for that and, and being able to move on and continue and see that as a learning experience. I think you're absolutely correct. And at some, at clinics, I'll say to people, I'll ask them, like, is making a mistake uh, a bad thing or a wrong thing? And they'll normally say, no, mm -hmm. it's not a bad thing. Yeah. I'll say, absolutely. I say, what happens if you made the same mistake 50 times? Is that a bad thing? Mm -hmm. And there's this little pause mm -hmm. in the room mm -hmm. because they don't quite know how to deal with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the answer, as far as I'm concerned, is no. And the answer is maybe you need 49 times to, to bump around on this till you get it. And uh, it's there is no limit to the to the sloppy playing as long as we attend to the mistakes. So very well said. I'm glad you saw that. Thank you. Very well, cool. I guess that's a perfect place to end this podcast. But I don't wanna. <laughs> I know. Well, we're trying to make them shorter and sweeter. Yeah, okay, we're making sure. Oh, exactly, but still. So, but it's been wonderful as always to hang with you. Thanks today. as well with me as well as me to hang with you. And thanks everybody for being here. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you for, for continuing to listen to us for those of you who have. And for, for new listeners, welcome. We're so glad you're here with us. We are. And we'll do more. And thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Jeff. See, See you next ya. time. <laughs> Bye.